So welcome everybody for tonight's great event. You're going to love tonight's adventure. Our speaker is going to get questions at the end. And so please use the chat function as usual to ask any questions when they arise because we don't want to miss any of your questions when they happen. And our program, as usual, is being recorded tonight. So welcome one and all. I'm Ann Mason, the member of the program committee for the National Railway Historical Society's DC chapter. And I'm your host for this evening. Joining me tonight is Garen Goldsmith and Jim Perry, who will be assisting me with the logistics and Carl Fowler, who will be our presenter. On our next slide, you will see that our DC chapter's mission is to, to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. And we accomplish this through a variety of programs, including sponsoring a scholarship to rail camp for a high school student, preserving and operating our beloved 1923 Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, maintaining a railroad library at Bowie Tower, Maryland, and publishing our monthly newsletter, The Timetable. Another way is to have our monthly free public programs, including tonight's event. And on the next slide, you will see our speaker tonight is Carl Fowler. And Carl is going to take us on a search to travel to Alaska by rail. This rail trip was one frequently requested by his clients at the Rail Travel Center, where he served as vice president and general manager for over 33 years. Yet it was a never a trip he could accommodate and arrange. Mr. Fowler is a passionate advocate for passenger rail service and he's traveled over 350,000 miles worldwide by train and counting. Mr. Fowler says uh, he is long life long advocacy for passenger rail travel originated in the family blood. After all, at the time of, of his birth, his mother was a Pullman reservationist at Penn Station in New York. So let's settle in and let Mr. Fowler tell us about the rail journey to Alaska, our journey that we cannot take by rail, but maybe someday. Okay, Carl, we're Thank ready you. to join you on the quest to Thanks. Alaska. I am, uh, as you mentioned, the retired uh, vice president, later president of Rail Travel Center and Rail Travel Adventures. And I've served on the board of directors of the Rail Passengers Association off and on for almost 50 years, I've been involved in this process almost all my life. In 1983, I created a specialty travel agency uh, that was designed to provide rail travel assistance and organize tours by train all over the world. And one of our primary destinations for the next 30 years plus was Alaska. But it was never possible, as you mentioned, for us to actually deliver a trip to Alaska because no road was ever completed to Alaska. And this is one of those funny things. We got constant questions from customers. I want to take the train to Alaska. I saw the White Pass in Yukon, or I saw the Alaska Road, and I want to take the train up there. And we'd have to say, you can't take the train up there, but here's what you can do. So this program will try to show you what you can do by rail and sea and motor coach to get ultimately all the way to Alaska, uh, mostly by rail. Uh, the impetus to build railways in the North Country came from the stampede of 1898, the Klondike Stampede. And at that time, there were no railroads in Alaska and virtually none in Northern Canada, at least above uh, the Vancouver area. Uh, but gradually railway lines were struck north. And what we're gonna do to follow this is to go from Portland, Oregon and Seattle, north to Alaska. So first of all, what does exist to start the trip is the Amtrak Cascade service. Uh, this is a service running from Eugene, Oregon to Vancouver, at least in normal times. At present, it is suspended from Seattle to Vancouver and replaced by a bus, but trains will hopefully be back soon. Uh, 
This line is somewhat haunting to me. Some of you may remember there was a terrible tragic accident at DuPont, Washington on this line in uh, December of uh, 2017. And that accident took the life of two of my best friends, Jim Hamery and Zach Wilhite. So it really resonates for me. But uh, the picture we showed you a moment ago is one of Amtrak's unique Talgo trains running along the shores of the Puget Sound on a line which has now been bypassed. If you look on the map on the right by a new route, which was actually an old freight bypass uh, upgraded for pasture service uh, to go around the sharp curve up at Point Defiance and avoid a narrow tunnel, which was causing traffic congestion for the BNSF. Sadly, it took out one of the most beautiful pieces of train riding in the Pacific Northwest for passengers. The Green Line is still very much open, but it, the mile is all freight trains. Uh, I lived and worked in Tacoma, Washington uh, for many years. My offices were uh, just uh, up behind the dome of the Tacoma Dome, a wooden dome stadium the sort of cool piece of Tacoma oddity. Tacoma had a magnificent Union Station uh, designed by uh, Mead and Stem, the same people who did Grand Central in New York. And it has one of the least known streetcar lines in the United States, it's only about a mile and a half long now, although they're just about to open a two mile long extension of it. Uh, but it starts over by the dome at a parking garage and runs past the new Amtrak station and through downtown Tacoma and past Tacoma Union Station. My company sponsored the last passenger train out of Union Station before it closed. And uh, now it hosts the gateway to the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, uh, Gail Chihuly sculptures, you can see them on the left there. Uh, the Pacific Northwest has nice resources for rail fanning. The Shea we're showing you on the right, unfortunately you can't ride behind at the moment because it was on the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad and the pandemic, at least for the moment has closed that down, but hopefully they'll find a way to reopen. There have been guests in the Northwest also. This was the visit by the SP 4449, 484 Northern during the NRHS convention back in 2010, I believe. I had the privilege of coming. Again, we're looking at the Point Defiance line before the pasture trains were detoured off of it and the 4449 making a run by on that magnificent stretch. North of Seattle, the Cascades trains follow what was once the main line of the Great Northern Railway. The Great Northern was always pro-passenger and its line north of Seattle hugs the shores of the Puget Sound at multiple locations and is extraordinarily scenic. Only takes about three and a half hours to get to Vancouver where you face the first of the challenges of getting on to the north to Alaska by rail. Uh, for many years, British Columbia wanted a railway from Vancouver into the deep interior of the province. And their dream was that that railway would someday get all the way to Alaska. Uh, it has not made it at least to date, but hopefully at some point it will. It began as the Pacific Great Eastern. And until the 1950s, you took a steamboat actually from Vancouver about 40 miles up this fjord to board the train at the upper end of the fjord. And then about 80 miles south of Prince George in the north, you detrained and got on a bus to go the rest of the way. But in the 1950s and 60s, the province of British Columbia completed a magnificently engineered line all the way north from Vancouver, uh, a thousand miles to Fort Nelson in the far north of British Columbia. Now, if you look at the two BC Rail maps here, Pacific Great Eastern on the left and BC Rail on the right, you notice that both of them have a long, uncompleted line getting up to something called Dease Lake. I don't know if you can see my cursor here or not, but Dease Lake lies up in the upper left of these maps. A substantial coal fields up there, and that was going to be the initial traffic base for that line. But the intent of the line to Dease Lake was that it would go to Alaska. Another 100 miles to the north is Watkins Lake in the Yukon Territory, and another 150 miles beyond that, uh, they would have taken them well into the Yukon Territory and within striking distance of Alaska. The Dease Lake line was almost finished. Ties were in place. In some places, the rails were sitting on the ties but not yet spiked down, and final ballasting was awaited when there was a change of government in British Columbia, and the new government came in and said, nope, that's it, we're done with the Dease Lake branch, and walked away from the uncompleted line. They did finish it to Jackson, where there is a lumber mill. Uh, we did run one excursion on it once, but uh, the line has never been finished. The upper portion up to Dees Lake is used by the local Indian bands, uh, First Nations bands, as they'd call them in Canada, for local travel. They run their four-wheel drives and their snowmobiles and their ATVs on it. But the line does go, again, a thousand miles north of Vancouver, first from Vancouver to Prince George, then from Prince George up to uh, Fort St. John or Dawson Creek. And then finally, the last leap was to Fort Nelson, which is on the Alaska Highway, and again is a thousand miles north of Vancouver. And uh, this is an extraordinary railroad. For many years in the 
1990s and early 2000s, my company ran joint tours up the full length of the British Columbia Railway, a company called Mountain Outens Tours. And we chartered bud cars, which BC Rail ran in regular service in those days and ran them all the way to Fort Nelson. Regular passenger service never operated north of Fort St. John and only briefly that far. Today, neither freight nor passenger service on a regular basis touches BC Rail south of Williams Lake routinely. The province leased the line out to the Canadian National Railway. And with the coming of the pandemic and with the desire to save money, the CN has ceased operating regular freight trains over the southern 250 some miles of BC Rail. But it is required by its lease to keep the line in good condition. And at the moment, the only user of the line is the Rocky Mountaineer tour train that goes from Vancouver to Canal, Canal to Jasper, a three day trip. It's the longest run that the Rocky Mountaineer has. The first day is Vancouver to Whistler. Second day is Whistler to Canal. Third day is Canal, Prince George, Jasper. So this passenger train you see is actually at the moment the only use of this magnificent line. But 20 years ago, it was graced not only by bud cars, but also by British Columbia's gloriously restored Royal Hudson train. Uh, the Royal Hudson was the Canadian Pacific Railway 464 class that got the royal designation because George VI was a rail fan. And when he took his honeymoon across Canada by rail, he was so impressed with the performance of those 464 Hudsons that he gave them the title royal and British Columbia Railway restored one. It's in the collection now of the BC Rail Historical Society up at Squamish and currently not in regular service, but the engine can run. Its backup engine was the 280-3716. This engine is now in Penticton in the BC interior and runs on a scenic railway in the BC interior in the Lakes District. But again, when I took these shots, it was running from Vancouver as the backup engine of the Royal Hudson up to Squamish. Most of the service in BC Rail, however, was RDC cars, the Caribou Dayliner. And this was one of the longest uh, bud car runs in North America after the demise of the Western Pacific's thousand mile bud car run from Salt Lake City to, Sac to Sacramento and Oakland, the longest one. Uh, 500 mile trip run originally seven days a week, later three times a week from Vancouver up through Lillooet uh, to Prince George. Uh, incredible scenery. These pictures, again, were taken on our excursion trips, and so they're a little bit different than the train you might have encountered if you came on your own in that there are more cars on in some cases because we were chartering two bud cars for the excursion part that went on beyond Prince George. The show place of the British Columbia Railway is the great grade up from Lillooet to Williams Lake. In 26 miles, the line climbs 3,000 feet above the Fraser River, and the views of the river are mind-boggling. Uh, this just climbs and climbs. It's an overall 3% grade. And this is one of the reasons why CN wanted to reroute through freight service off of this route as much as possible, because of course it required helpers to ascend this grade. But uh, the Rocky Mountaineer train again still does it once a week at least, uh, basically between May and October each year. Fraser River is the great river of British Columbia and of the Canadian West, rises up on the Continental Divide near Jasper National Park, where there's a triple Continental Divide. Waters up in Jasper can flow to the Arctic Sea, to the Pacific, or to the Atlantic via the Hudson Bay. It's a triple Continental Divide. Off the viewing platform of Goldleaf Dome Car on the Rocky Mountaineer. There's some Rocky Mountaineer publicity shots. I did not take these. These are Rocky Mountaineer shots. However, now we're back to our charters. Milepost 398, one of the great trestles on BC Rail, as we near Prince George. It's our chartered bud car train running over it. The BC Rail bud car fleet was gradually sold off and dispersed. Some of the cars were in Oregon and still run on uh, lines in the west. Others went as far east as Newport Island in Rhode Island, uh, where they still can be ridden on excursions. But uh, again, for over 30 years, uh, BC Rail ran bud car service every day and ran it with tremendous reliability. So their dream was to get to Alaska, but they never made it. They did, however, get a remarkable electrified coal branch built into a place called Tumbler Ridge, north of Prince George, British Columbia. Most of this coal went out to China or Korea, particularly Korea. Uh, the mines have stopped actively working, but they're still taking out accumulated supplies. But the electrification has sadly been shut down. It was still active, however, in the 1990s when we took these pictures. Mountie met us up at uh, Dawson Creek. Uh, one of our lovely ladies there chatting with him. 
on the right is the crossing of the Peace River approaching. And uh, this is about 650 to 700 miles north of Vancouver. Uh, the uh, railway comes across a plateau and suddenly below you, there is a double horseshoe curve and then this glorious trestle across the Peace River. And then it ascends back up where you see the fog in the distance and back onto the plateau beyond. Uh, very little remarked upon because regular pasture service only ran over this northern part of the line for about three years, but it is a stunning stretch of railway. Further north, other bridges are actually used by both the railroad and the highway. Uh, this is the local road up near Fort Nelson actually turning onto the railway to go across this bridge. Beautiful wildflowers in the far north. And uh, we're actually now almost a thousand miles north of Vancouver and incredibly we're in wheat country. The Rocky Mountains block the storms coming in from the Pacific and it's warmed by the Alaska Current and it's actually warm enough to grow wheat a, wheat a thousand miles north of Vancouver. But you still haven't gotten to Alaska. So what's the alternative? Uh, the Canadian railway called the Grand Trunk Pacific thought they had that figured out. They would strike a line from Edmonton uh, out to Prince Rupert, about 600 miles north of Vancouver, which if you look at a globe is actually closer to the major ports of Asia than Vancouver, Seattle, or San Francisco. Uh, a man named George Melville Hayes was the great backer of the Grand Trunk Line's Pacific extension. Uh, and one of the ways you can follow his particular eccentricity is going west from Winnipeg to Edmonton across the prairies, station names on what had been the Grand Trunk Line are alphabetized, A through Z, and the alphabet repeats a couple of times. That was Hayes's way of making it simple to figure out where you were. Uh, he went to Europe in 1912 to raise more money to complete his empire and was thrilled to come home on the Titanic would get him home faster than any other ship and would be so comfortable. And he, of course, and most of the bonds he was bringing home went to the bottom of the Atlantic. Uh, but the line did get completed to Prince Rupert. This is a map of the dream where it made connections to steamer services going north to Alaska. Uh, but if you look on the right hand side, you can see near Terrace up near the top of this map that there is a series of dotted lines heading off to the north. And that was the Grand Trunks idea of how to get to Alaska would have gone up through Watson Lake and Whitehorse. And that basically follows what today is called the Casier Stewart Highway, a secondary route to the Alaska Highway, but a magnificent driveway to get to uh, Alaska. This line has one of Via Rail Canada's best kept secrets, a little train called the Skeena, which runs three times a week from Jasper to Prince George, where you overnight hotel at your own expense, and then on to Prince Rupert the next day. It has survived because although roads appear to parallel it, there actually are long stretches on the other side of various rivers where there are no roads into isolated villages. And for that reason, the Skeena has been maintained and it's a magnificently scenic run. The homemade single level dome car there on the left was the model for the similar cars that the Rocky Mountaineer is using in Colorado and using for their silver leaf service in uh, the Rockies. This particular car was built originally for the British Columbia Railway for a very briefly operated tour train called the Whistler Northland. Uh, however, Via Rail bought the three cars that were made and they're used in the summer as an upgraded tour class on the Skeena and on the Canadian itself uh, as an extra lounge space for sleeping car passengers. Ultimately, this route reaches the fjords going out to Prince Rupert. Uh, this is the Skeena River Fjord and Again, it's absolutely magnificent. The block signal you see there has just gone in when I took this picture. Uh, the uh, line had not historically been signaled. Now it is actually blanketed with container trains and coal trains. And uh, the Skeena, although it has a very leisurely schedule, is often three to four hours late because the CN runs uh, under precision scheduled railroading 200 to 250 car long freights on the line, but most of the sidings aren't that long. So uh, trains basically get fleeted two or three hours, everybody goes west, then two or three hours, everybody goes east. And if the Via train shows up in the middle of the fleet, it often gets rather badly stabbed. Uh, this was the predecessor to the dome liner I've been showing you. This is what Via and the CN had run historically to Prince Rupert. And this was a full service train with sleepers. It did not overnight in Prince George, but it cost so much to run with sleepers and diners that it was replaced by the day train that you saw in the previous slides. At Prince Rupert again, you had to board a steamship. And uh, to this day, you still could. Alaska State Ferries will take you north to Skagway. So this is going up the inside passage. In the days of 
active railway construction in Alaska. The primary uh, lines serving Alaska were the Canadian Pacific's Coastal Steamer Service and a company called the Alaska Steamship Lines, which ran uh, freight and passenger service from Seattle to Alaska until the early 1950s, when they dropped the passenger side of it, although to this day, they still have a limited presence as a freight carrier. This is from an Alaska state ferry between Juneau and Skagway, summer of 2009. So this is what actually did get built in Alaska. And we'll visit all of these lines, at least briefly. First, the White Pass and Yukon over on the right, three foot narrow gauge line completed in 1900 to bypass the infamous Chilkut Pass. I'll talk more about that shortly to get the Stampeders up to Whitehorse where they could board steamships to go on to Dawson up in the Northern Yukon Territory, the height of the gold mining area. Next over the Yakutat Southern, also known as the Situk Railway, which was built to haul fish and ran with the tides. If the tide was out, the boats could not get into the port and the railway didn't bother to run. If the tide was in, they would run trains. Uh, there was no fare to ride it as a passenger, but you could. And that line actually lasted for decades, well into the 1970s. Third, perhaps the most amazing line in Alaska, the Copper River in Northwestern, which went from Cordova on the Gulf of Alaska to Chitna and Kennecott in the Alaska interior. This line actually at one point ran on the face of a glacier. And I've got quite a few pictures of this. I got to see its terminus at Kennecott in 1978 before it became a national park and before it was redeveloped. And it was the ultimate dream of a ghost town. Literally, there were patient records clipped to the beds in the hospital and the hospital had closed 40 years earlier in 1938. Next to the West, the Alaska Road itself, which is very much in business, uh, very active to this day. And then beyond Fairbanks, Heading to the north, the narrow gauge Ch uh, Tanana Valley Railway, which actually, since this map was produced, has been partially recreated as a new line of the Alaska Railroad itself, heading out towards North Pole and eventually perhaps down to British Columbia and Alberta, we shall see. And finally, over at Nome on the Seward Peninsula, uh, the Wild Goose, also known as the Curly Q, Salmon River, and uh, Nome Alaska Railway a narrow gauge line that was built literally on the tundra, uh, ran off and on from 1906 to the 1950s. And when things were just done, was simply abandoned and left. And uh, it's still there, sort of. And we'll show you some pictures of that at the end of this show. So first, the White Pass in Yukon. This is like the Durango and Silverton today, a pasture hauler. But for decades, it moved ore from copper mines down and was always successful. It took two years to build and was an extraordinary accomplishment. Went from sea level, where the trains actually, in the historic days and today, go right out on the pier to meet cruise ships, and ascended the White Pass. Incredible mountain ascent. Uh, the first 25 miles of this railway is one of the great stupendous mountain railroads of the world. You can see the highway on the other side of the valley on the right. Most cruise ship pastures go one way by bus and one way by train. But this line went all the way to Whitehorse, where again, the steamer services could consistently run on the Yukon River. The Great Trestle on the right has now been supplanted by a newer modern bridge, and it's still there, but its foundations were becoming unsteady and the White Pass and Yukon had to create a new trestle behind it. We're going over that new trestle in this shot. These are pictures that we took on a charter of mine in about 2009 that went all the way from Carcross down to Skagway on one of our Alaska tours. And we actually chartered them to run for us. And they gave us all kinds of run bys and extra treats. Uh, this is the White Pass Summit, only 2,800 feet, but it's a hell of a climb. Uh, and again, this is Fraser right at the Canadian border. Most tour passengers get off here and return immediately. And if you do, you're considered never to have left the United States, even though the end of the platform is in Canada. Since the pandemic struck, the White Pass and Yukon has not run beyond this point, but its tracks are intact to a place called Carcross, about another 40 miles to the north and in serviceable condition. And in normal times, they run one train a day all the way to Carcross, much more frequently to Fraser and the White Pass. This is the stop at Lake Bennett, the station on the right. This was immensely beloved in the days of regular service because it was the meal stop. And they served moose stew, 
with freshly baked breads that were the most remarkably high standard quality. And when they did the charter for us in 2009, although they had not been doing that on a regular basis, they pulled it off again for us. This is where before the road was completed, the stampeders arrived at a lake from which they could float most of the way down to Dawson, or at least if they had the money to Whitehorse where they could get on a steamboat. But to do this, you had to climb almost 3000 vertical feet up the Chilka Pass, carrying on your back all the supplies you needed for six months. At the Canadian border, the Mounties actually had a Gatling gun set up to take all the guns away from the American miners. Uh, in Hollywood movie mythology, there was lots of bang, bang and shoot them up. Sergeant Preston of the Mounties, on King, on, on Mighty Dog. It's all nonsense. The uh, guns were taken away. One guy did sneak one in to uh, Dawson and confronted the legendary Mountie Sam Steele with his six shooter and said to Sam, the man ain't been born who can take my gun. And Sam said, yes, he has, and grabbed the guy's gun and locked him up. Uh, things were orderly in Dawson City. The whorehouses closed on Sunday, but were allowed to function quite normally the rest of the week to keep things tidy. Uh, but in any case, before the road was completed, after you went over that incredible hike over the pass, you basically were stuck here until spring when you could build your own boat and hopefully float down this series of lakes most of the way to Whitehorse. Below Whitehorse, steamboats regularly ran until the 1950s uh, to Dawson. And this is an example of the kind of boats that the Stampeders would have built. The church on the left is the Anglican church, and they spent all winter in 1898, spring of 1899, building this church. It only held services for two years, but it's an example of magnificent craftsmanship. It still stands. One more last look at Lake Bennett. North of here, the railway goes along a series of lakes down to Carcross, very beautiful country, completely wild and remote, no roads paralleling. This looks like deep into the autumn, but actually this was the last week of August. Uh, the fall color comes early in the north. And this is your destination now on the White Pass in Yukon. This is Carcross. Uh, the steamer on the right didn't go all the way to Whitehorse. It went up a series of side lakes from Carcross. But this is the furthest point at the moment that the White Pass in Yukon is serviceable. Uh, north of here to Whitehorse, it has not run since 1981, although the rails are in place. And in theory, it could operate again. There's a short uh, trolley, battery powered trolley operation actually in Whitehorse. But the main line from Carcross to Whitehorse again has been dormant since 1981. Uh, the tooth shy, however, is typical of the uh, stern wheelers that the White Pass and Yukon ran on the Yukon River. Uh, this one, however, again ran up a series of lakes out of Carcross, did not actually run on the main stem of the Yukon. But from Whitehorse on until you got to Fairbanks, there was no railroad. And you went by car or you bushwhacked or you took steamboats on the lower river and bushwhacked back up. I will admit that the picture on the left is slightly a cheat. It's not really the Alaska Highway. That's actually the road in Denali National Park. But on the right, we have the Alaska Highway. Gentlemen, I met in the summer of 1978 back in the woods at Denali. I was taking a short walk into the woods and came across this moose who made it very clear I should leave. And I did very quickly the great site that everyone going to Alaska dreams of to see Denali, the great one, the tallest peak in North America. The dirty little secret of Denali is it comes out typically only about one day in five. I had had six visits to the Denali region over six different days before I finally saw it, although in more recent years, I've seen it multiple times. It's truly a glorious site if it's out over 20,000 feet high, but normally it forms incredible mantles of clouds and only the lower side peaks turn up the highway between Anchorage and Fairbanks looking down towards Denali. So we'll take a side trip here over and visit one of the earliest railways to be completed in Alaska, the Copper River in Northwestern. Copper River Northwestern again went from Cordova down on the Gulf of Alaska, inland up the Copper and Kennecott rivers to uh, great copper mines at Kennecott. Uh, the main line was over 130 miles long and it had astounding engineering feats on it. Uh, absolutely incredible mind-boggling engineering feats. And like many railroads in the lower 48, as well as in Alaska, the builders had big dreams. If you look on the map here, you can see the steamboat lines coming into Cordova down in the lower left. And then if you look up further here to Chitna, you can see there was a dream of a long line going up to the interior, which would have served a series of coal mines and eventually would have ended up in Fairbanks. None of that was ever built. But the main line continued west to Kennecott, 
And that's the same Kennecott as the Kennecott Copper Company's operations down in Utah. But the Kennecott mine in Alaska was for its time the richest copper mine in the world. Uh, and it was worth building this remarkable railway to it. And it was remarkable for a number of reasons, not least of which the war had had to fight with glaciers. About 50 miles up the line, it came to a point where it crossed the river. They built what they called the Million Dollar Bridge, only to have the Million Dollar Bridge almost immediately threatened by glaciers approaching it. This was an aerial shot taken in the 1920s of the Million Dollar Bridge, and they haven't been plowing in this shot, but uh, if you look just in the center, upper center there, that's one glacier coming down, and the river itself has another one just around the corner. At one point, these two got to within 1,600 feet of the railway before they providentially retreated. But further up, there was no dealing with it, no avoiding it. Uh, this is the Allen Glacier. And uh, first, the Copper River Northwestern had to tunnel under one of its avalanche slides uh, along the lateral moraine. And then for a distance of about five and a half miles, they actually had to lay track on the outwash of the terminal moraine of that glacier. And it required constant checking by section crews to make sure the track hadn't shifted out of alignment. Uh, then they went into a series of magnificent canyons uh, along the Copper River. High trestles were built. Most of these, by the way, still exist, although to see this one, you'd have to bushwhack in about 15 miles on the abandoned grade. At Chitna, uh, they crossed the uh, Copper River where it joined the Chitna River and the Kennecott River. And this is where that branch line of the coal fields would have gone off. You notice that the trestle actually descends down almost to water level uh, and then climbs back up. There was a set of switchbacks on the far side of this. This is the Gilhana River trestle, which is still in existence. The highway today actually goes down the slide on the left and parallels this. You can no longer drive across it. But uh, when the railway died, the state of Alaska intended to convert the entire Copper River Northwestern to a highway. They never finished it. The part in the canyons with all the glaciers was never fully completed to a highway. And so much damage was done to it by the 1964 earthquake that that project basically was simply walked away from. This is some examples of the kind of damage the earthquake did. This was a highway attempt to get into the Kennecott region. Uh, the outer spans were knocked down. And at least when I took these pictures in 1978, they had been down for 14 years. I don't think this bridge was ever rebuilt. This was in fact, how you got into Kennecott by 1978. You literally pulled yourself across the Kennecott River on this little tram. Uh, this looks like I did this all the way across. Actually, this is a cheat. I flew in from Chitna uh, to McCarthy on the uh, behind me in the picture on the left. And then my friend Huntley and I went down the railroad grade to where the river was and tried to pull ourselves across on the tram. I realized when I got about halfway across that neither I nor Huntley would ever be able to get back if we went to the far side. And I went back as quickly as I possibly could. So how did the railroads get across this? Well, the answer is there was a trestle here, just like the one at Chitna, which went down almost to water level and then ascended back up. They did that because every spring a dam would burst on the Kennecott Glacier about 10 miles above and a wall of water comes down the river and would wash out the bridge. And ultimately the railroad just decided, look, this is gonna happen every year, we'll build it light and we'll just put it back. But of course, once they abandoned the line in 1938, there was no longer any point in putting it back and it disappeared. There is now a footbridge actually across the river here. The state of Alaska built a footbridge, but not a road bridge. You can drive your car to the far side, the west side, uh, go across the footbridge by foot, and then you can either walk into McCarthy a mile or to Kennecott six miles, or a local shuttle bus will take you in. Here is the uh, bridge that is no more. This is McCarthy. Uh, this was the uh, naughty part of the Kennecott mining empire. Uh, the Kennecott Copper Company kept all booze and all women of the night out of Kennecott, but five miles down the grade here in McCarthy, everything was open wild open, wide open, and uh, much travel occurred between the two locations, even in speeder cars. When I had the visit up here in 1978, they flew us into McCarthy, and then we were shuttled up to Kennecott. And the highway had been the railroad, and the track had never been torn up on this side of the river because the trestle washed out. When they decided to make a highway out of it, they just took a bulldozer up and shoved the railroad aside. Uh, the twisted rails and all were lying to the side. But this is what you reached at the upper end of it. Again, one of the richest uh, copper strikes in history. Uh, 1906 to 1911, the road was built. 1911 to 1938, they operated here. There are really four mines here. 
that all use the railway to come out. Uh, this was the terminus station. And these tracks were not shut over by the uh, bulldozers. When I was up there in 1978, rails were still there. In the siding near the powerhouse there, there was a switch. I walked up to the switch and threw it and it worked. Uh, there were calendars from 1938 on the walls inside the buildings. Uh, many of the cottages were occupied by squatters, basically, although I understand now today they've bought some of them. Uh, this ghost town has been preserved by the National Park Service as part of the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. But again, when I was here in 78, it was almost like 1938 had been last fall. The last train out was in November of 38. I was here in 78. There were patient records clipped to the beds in the hospital. And in the office, the file cabinets had simply been dumped. Uh, all of the records of the employees were all over the floor. Uh, I just picked up one uh, beaten mine record here on an injured worker on the left. This was the most perfectly preserved ghost town I have ever seen anywhere. And uh, what a remarkable thing it was to visit it. I look very intrepid here with my ice axe. Uh, this is the glacier that goes right by Kennecott. Kennecott is actually on the lateral moraine of the Kennecott Glacier. And at night, it groans and creaks and rumbles. And you think about it kind of when you're there. Uh, I walked out about two miles from the town. We were supposed to get right up the glacier, could touch it. But before I got there, a grizzly bear came down the trail on the other side, and I thought better of going any further and returned. I do need to tell one farewell and sort of sad final story about Kennecott, however, uh, of a tragedy that occurred while we were there. Alaska prides itself in tolerating eccentricity and tolerating absolute freedom. And McCarthy and Kennecott attracted a gentleman named Hastings, Lewis Hastings. He had a sort of failed programmer from California who moved out there in 1980. Now in 78, when I was out in McCarthy, a local kid took us on a charter by four wheel drive out to see that washed out bridge that I showed you. And while we were out at the bridge, he nostalgically said, you know, I could kill your ass out here and nobody would ever know what happened to you. And I thought, oh, that was damned weird. Well, in 1983, uh, Mr. Hastings, who had a house in Anchorage and a cabin up in Kennecott, did kill a bunch of people. He murdered six of the 22 residents of McCarthy and Kennecott and wounded two more of them. He'd gotten the messianic notion into his mind that he was going to kill everyone in Kennecott, steal the mail plane that came once a week, fly it up towards Fairbanks and crash into the Alaska pipeline and destroy the pipeline and thus save the wilderness. He's doing 624 years in prison now at the Max Federal Supermax out in Kansas. Uh, sad thing to think about, but uh, I actually met a couple of the people he murdered, which is a sobering thought. And it occurred to me at the time that to a limited degree, at least, the celebration of extreme eccentricity was such that Alaskans and McCarthy could uh, tell who was truly free, but they couldn't tell who was truly crazy, alas for them. No state troopers within an hour's flight. There was virtually no cell phone service then. Uh, when the idiot went on his rampage, luckily, uh, a local pilot was at the McCarthy Airport and was able to fly one of the wounded out, and they tipped off the Alaska state troopers who came in with a helicopter and caught him on the road with the snowmobile he'd stolen trying to escape. But again, he killed six people, wounded two, and there were only 22 people total between Kennecott and McCarthy. So, something to think about. So finally, we get to the real Alaska Railroad. This, of course, is the centerpiece of railway-based tourism in Alaska today. Uh, but it was built to be the main line of Alaska. And most of the population of the state has always lived in what they call the railroad belt, which is basically Stewart, Anchorage, Fairbanks along the main line of this railroad. This was constructed as a standard gauge line, uh, built basically from 1903 to 1923. The private companies that started it kept going bankrupt. Eventually, the federal government took over, 1917, and completed the line. In 1923, President Warren G. Harding came up for the dedication of the uh, Tananiana Bridge, which was the final piece of engineering on the line. Harding died on the way home. He got food poisoning and the boat going back down to California and passed away. Uh, but uh, he did make the dedication ceremony. The portion of the Alaska Railway from Anchorage to Seward, in my view, is the most scenic railway line in Alaska and one of the most beautiful in the U.S. But it's not so well known as the main line to Denali and Fairbanks because from 1953, when the Alaska Steamship Company stopped running ships to 1983, 
there was almost no pasture service on it. The Alaska Road discontinued the regular train to Seward. And the only thing they ran was this bus car and truck train uh, from Portage to uh, a new harbor at Whittier that had been built because it was ice free. And also they felt that submarines from an enemy like Japan wouldn't be able to get into it. The original terminus was Seward. In 1986, the Alaska Railroad decided to reestablish pasture service to Seward and to do it initially with bud cars. And we chartered actually one of their bud cars uh, for the first run down there and ran the first pasture train back to Seward in 23 years. I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment, but these are some Alaska Railroad pictures of a train they call the Glacier Discovery, which runs most of the Seward main line and also down the branch to Whittier. Today, the car trains like that are no longer needed because you can drive through the railway tunnel. Uh, they've paved the tunnel and uh, you can drive through it. It's half an hour one way, half an hour the other. When the trains are coming, of course, the tunnel closes for a while. Uh, Whittier is a common cruise ship port, although cruise ships also go to Seward. And the glacier in the background is one of the reasons I think this line is so amazing. In 1978, that glacier came to within 100 yards of the track. Uh, since then, it's retreated almost a mile, uh, but the glacier discovery train takes you to a station at the foot of it, and you can get off and take about a three-hour walk up to it if you wish. You saw one of their homemade Gold Star, uh, U.S. made, not homemade, Gold Star dome cars. Those were built by Colorado Rail Car for them and in Fort Lupton, Colorado, and are fabulous cars. This is the Turnigan Arm Fjord south of Anchorage. All the Whittier trains did traverse this stretch. Uh, this fjord is notable for having a tidal bore in it. Uh, literally, the tidal regime is so severe and it narrows so totally coming in that twice a day, an actual wall of water runs up the fjord. Now, these are some pictures from our charter in 1986 of what turned out to be the first pasture train to Seward since 1953. Uh, the first public one was about an hour behind us. And a bunch of rail fan magazines the next month showed pictures of what they said was the first Alaska Railroad train to Seward. It was actually our charter. But uh, the AR was nice enough to run some runbys for us. This is up by the glacier. You can see they put the step box down for us. This narrow canyon uh, is the beginning of the ascent over the Shugach Range down to uh, Seward. There is a fabulous horseshoe curve. Again, you can see the glacier in the background there. It has receded quite a bit since I took this picture in 86, but this fabulous switchback is still there, horseshoe curve. This is the line along the uh, Turnigan Arm Fjord. And here's the tidal bore. Uh, some of you may have seen the tidal bores up in Nova Scotia and the Bay of Fundy. It's the same phenomenon. The tide is built up sort of into a ridge by a narrow entry into this vast bay. And then when it spreads out, it forms this wall of water that comes down the bay twice a day. Uh, when it's not there, the mudflats go out 200 yards and more from shore and they look hard as concrete, but this thing comes in in five or 10 minutes. And if you're out on those flats when the tidal bore arrives, you're in extremely deep trouble. The main line again today for most people is assumed to be between Anchorage and Fairbanks, although in truth, the line all the way to Seward is of great importance for freight travel for the Alaska Railroad and has pasture service on it from May through September. Alaska Road is even discussing commuter rail into Anchorage. Uh, they've built a station at the airport, which is only used by cruise ship companies, but uh, will hopefully someday host commuter rail. These are some Alaska Road promotional pictures that they gave me when I was marketing their services for those 30 some years, uh, the upper level of one of their gold leaf dome cars. Now, these are some pictures of their second generation of streamlined pasture trains. After World War II, the Alaska Road bought an entire fleet of United States Army hospital cars and converted them to coaches and diners, and for many years ran them on their daylight service from Anchorage to Fairbanks, calling them the Aurora. But when Amtrak came in, they purchased a new fleet from the Union Pacific, equipment that had been bought by the UP for its Challenger dome liner, and moved these cars up to Alaska. And they're still up there, along with a considerably enlarged fleet, including new coaches built in Korea. But these pictures, again, were taken in 78, and the cars were so close to their standings as, as a Union Pacific chair cars that the pictures of UP National Parks in the Southwest were still in the bulkheads of the coach section. Uh, this is the summer train today, which is uncontestably the world's largest dome liner. Uh, I took these pictures again in 2009, uh, the north and southbound meeting just south of Denali National Park Station. 19 Vista dome cars on the northbound that day and 17 on the southbound, belonging to various cruise lines, to various tour companies, the Alaska Road itself. This is the main line over Broad Pass, 
uh, running parallel to Denali National Park. It's a stretch of about uh, 90 miles with no roads directly next to the railway. And the railroad runs 12 months of the year, a flag stop train at least once a week in this section to let people get in and out of isolated cabins and hamlets in this roadless stretch. Once again, this looks like it must be late September, early October, but actually it's late August, but the tundra was going magnificently to fall color. And again, this is broad pass. We meet one of the coal trains here. Uh, you can see one of the UP dome cars and also a Burlington dome car, a Bud Streamline one. This is the bridge just south of Denali Station, the highest bridge on the Alaska Railroad. And here we have the 1978 version again, arriving at Denali Park Station. They were still using F units and uh, an E unit, B unit with uh, HEP power in it. Today, uh, much more modern equipment. This is the view of the train as it was in 2009 at Denali. Just north of Denali, the Nanana River Canyon, magnificent river canyon with the railway twisting and turning along its side, highway on the far side. And then this is the town of Nanana, and this is where the Golden Spike Ceremony for the last grade was held, and which President Harding attended. North of this to Fairbanks, the railway was originally narrow gauge. Uh, when the decision was made to extend the Alaska Road all the way to Fairbanks, the line from here to Fairbanks was enlarged to standard gauge. Ultimately, most of the rest of the narrow gauge was pulled up. But again, as I mentioned, a bit of the narrow gauge territory to the northeast of Fairbanks is on the new alignment that's been pushed out to North Pole, and who knows, maybe someday to the lower 48 or at least to Alberta. Here's a view of the mountain, the great one, Denali, from the train. These are Vista Dome car pictures of it, one day when it was actually out. Another view of the 19 car dome liner. Alaska Railroad has a number of unique aspects of it. One of them is that it runs a profitable dining car service. We've all been told that you can't make money on diners, but the Alaska Railroad licenses out the dining car service to a caterer from Anchorage, uh, and they make money on it. It's profitable, as does the caterer. Here's the interior of one of those UP cars and uh, the train at the end of track, at least in 1978 in Fairbanks. This is a little hint of the Tanada River Railway, the narrow gauge line, but this is actually at a small gold mine just outside of Fairbanks, which lets you pan for gold after riding this little train to it. It's cute, uh, but it's about the only narrow gauge line right now that you can ride other than the White Pass at Yukon. This is what the gold miners were after up at Fairbanks, uh, dredge mining, these colossal dredges actually walked along the stream beds and uh, sucked up the uh, gravel and then the gold was sorted out of the gravel. Uh, this is the gold of the modern time in the Fairbanks area. This is the Alaska pipeline coming down from Prudhoe. That road actually goes all the way to the Arctic Sea at Prudhoe Bay. Where the railroads didn't go, there was over a thousand miles of steamboat routes in Alaska. And at least one sternwheeler still operates the Discovery at Fairbanks. She doesn't go very far now. She goes down the Tanana River a few miles, the Chena River, pardon me, a few miles to the Tanana. She used to go a few miles further in the Tanana, but that's silted up now. But uh, they do stop at a uh, musher's place where you get to learn about dog sled racing and meet uh, Susan Butcher, who won the Iditarod race several times. And you stop at an Indian camp to see how salmon are smoked and dried. But mostly it's the experience of riding on a sternwheeler. And again, the, the Yukon River system for well over a thousand miles had sternwheel services on it into the late 50s and even to some degree into the early 1960s. Uh, and where the roads didn't go, the steamboats did. And finally, a look just briefly at a couple of the odd railroads of Alaska. First, the Yakutat Southern, also known as the Sitok Railway. This was that very, very short, short line. Uh, built in 1903 and operated till 1971, which helped to bring fish to Yakutat from the cannery at Sitok. And basically only ran when the tide was high because the fishing boats couldn't get in when the tide was low. It used a steam engine, which is still preserved up there on the right, at least sort of preserved. And later this odd battery powered car down on the right. Uh, and they had this uh, combined sort of homemade RDC car, uh, which could handle both passengers and freight. They did have a regular coach when the steam engine was running, but after World War II, the steam engine was retired. At Nome, this remarkable railroad ran on the surface of the tundra, again, opened uh, in 1906, 
off and on until 1921, and then they walked away from it, just left it there. In the early 1950s, local tourism interests up in the Nome area tried to revive it, to run it for the tourist trade, uh, the Wild Goose Railway. It didn't succeed, but it's still there. Uh, these are pictures that I borrowed from an obliging site called the Clio.com uh, of the engines of the uh, Nome Railway still sitting out of the tundra to this day. Uh, and there are reports that bits and pieces of rail survive as well. This was laid on the surface of the tundra. So to put it mildly, it was an uneven surface to operate trains on, but you can see a lot of wheel sets there. And apparently this was they had some 30, 40 miles of track at its peak. Apparently there are still places where you can find some rail up there, although nothing has run for many, many decades. And that was the last train to nowhere. And that may be an appropriate ending to our coverage of Alaska, except for this one last enticing slide the railway that never was. This is the latest dream of Alaska to Alberta, building a standard gauge railway all the way down to Edmonton, which would connect in at Edmonton, of course, to the main North American railway system. And if you know your geography of the North Country, note this Mrs. Whitehorse, which is the primary pivot point of the Alaska Highway. Uh, it takes a different route to the interior, I think hoping to capitalize perhaps on some mine deposits and ore deposits, but uh, this is a dream that they think they can build for about $15 billion. I think you probably would want to take that times around 10, but uh, there is serious consideration of this. Uh, President Reagan signed some legislation to help with the cost of surveys in Alaska at least. Uh, and so who knows, maybe in 20 more years, we actually will be able to take a train to Alaska, the journey that never was, but finally is. Thank you, that's the show. Thanks very much. We have a couple of questions. It, Donna asks, how did the engines and other cars get to their final destination? Things were brought up on barges to Alaska. Uh, the White Pass and Yukon owned a whole fleet of uh, barges and tugs for them, which could bring railway equipment up from the lower 48 to Skagway. To this day, the Alaska Railroad works with a barge company to take freight cars down to the lower 48 from primarily Whittier, not Seward. The traffic that goes down to Seward is mostly coal going to Korea. But uh, in Seattle, a train will be pushed onto a barge. The barge will be pulled by a towboat up to Alaska and it'll be unloaded at Whittier and it continues on the Alaska Railroad. Uh, the narrow gauge lines like the Copper River Northwestern, the trains were brought up in the holds of ships and unloaded very carefully. Uh, in some cases, coaches or equipment was built in Alaska, but basically no, mostly it was brought up by barge or by freighter and uh, moved from there. Great. Um... There was some interest in the mine, the mining. Uh, yeah, there's both copper and, and coal and gold that you were talking about. But the one question that we got was really around Kennecott and asking, this is a, obviously an abandoned spot now, but is there, do you know if there's still any copper yeah, copper the, Kennecott copper, the Kennecott Copper Company claimed when they closed down that the deposits were exhausted. But actually what was exhausted was the ore that would be easy to get out. Uh, and there probably is still ore up in the Kennecott area, but it will never be mined because the whole area where the mines are is now the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. Okay. So there's going to be no future mining up there. Uh, but th the claim that the mines were wholly exhausted uh, was generally made by the locals up there to be an excuse to allow them to close the railway uh, without going through any regulatory process to do it. Uh, and of course, there's an irony. They shut down in 1938. If they had made it another year or so to 41, what would have happened? Lots of interesting questions there. The World War II, would they have managed to keep it open? Who knows? Perhaps yeah. they might have. Uh, in the case of other mine deposits, the coal that's up in the Anchorage area, of course, is being mined. Uh, the Alaska Railroad has several coal branches, uh, and the deposits that the Copper River Northwestern would have reached are, in fact, to some degree being served by the main Alaska Railway. Over at Seward, uh, it was to get to gold mining. Uh, surface gold mining, as it also was at Fairbanks. So a lot of different mineral targets were addressed by Alaska railroads. And I'm assuming that the, well, maybe I shouldn't assume that Kennecott Company 
still owns the copper reserves in that area? No, again, it's all in National Park Service land now. Uh, Kennecott okay. donated the railroad and all of its assets to the state of Alaska in the late 1940s with the idea that it would be turned into a road. Uh, Kennecott itself is a mixture of National Park Service and private inholdings. Many of the cottages are owned by people who were sort of uh, roosting there when the park was established. And in general, in national parks, uh, what's called an inholding, which is a private uh, enclave within the park, can be held as long as the person occupying it was alive. But they can't always leave it to their heirs. And in mm -hmm. particular, they usually can't sell it. Uh, but in the case of the copper mines, no, I think there's no chance that they would ever be reopened. And I'm quite sure that the National Park Service now controls it all. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was an excellent, excellent uh, talk and really makes us all want to get on a train and go to Alaska. And if we can't get to Alaska, at least get close to Alaska on a number of, of uh, rail tracks that, that you mentioned. That if anyone has an interest in going to Kennecott or sort of following the remnants of the Copper River Northwestern, the Alaska State Ferry System serves Cordova out of Valdez uh, two or three times a week in the summer. And you can drive about 65 miles of the grade from there up to the area where the glaciers actually had the track on the glacier at one time. From the north end, uh, you can actually drive all the way to the far side of the river by McCarthy, although it would be helpful probably to have a four wheel drive vehicle. There is a lodge at Kennecott in what had been the office building of the mine. Uh, and there is also a lodge in McCarthy. And those lodges can arrange air transportation into McCarthy, uh, as well as uh, pick you up if you want to drive your own vehicle. So it's not actually that difficult to get in. The Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve includes Mount St. Elias, which is the highest peak in Canada and the second highest peak in Alaska. It's over 19,000 feet high. Uh, and it's an astounding national park. But aside from the one tiny intrusion of a road at McCarthy, it is completely undeveloped and completely roadless. And basically access is by uh, plane landing on gravel bars out in the middle of nowhere um, and extraordinary. But flight seeing is very popular at McCarthy and it's not insanely expensive. You can get a flight seeing trip over the national park for around $250. And uh, so that's something that's one way to see a bit more of it. Uh, the ghost town again, I know is somewhat more stabilized than what I saw in 78. Uh, the Park Service had volunteers up there for years trying to inventory and catalog the paperwork that I found was still all over the floor in the offices. I'm sure the patient records are no longer attached to beds. The beds were made up, by the way, also. They were all sheeted, <laughs> blankets in place, pillows on them, just been sitting there from 1938 for 40 years. But anyway, that's how you'd get to McCarthy today, is you would either take a tour package arranged through one of the lodges, or you'd drive to the far side of the river, uh, walk across on the footbridge and then take the shuttles up into McCarthy or Kennecott. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Um, do you know if there is a military base in Alaska today and whether that base uses rail travel? Elmendorf Air Force Base uh, near Anchorage, I believe, does from time to time use rail to bring things in. Okay. That's the one I know for sure is along the railroad. Okay, in the case well, of most Air Force bases, they would tend to fly most of their own stuff in, but the railway does have a line that goes by the base. May I, may I say something? And, yes, absolutely. Yes. Well, hi, yeah, hi, Carl. This is uh, John Cowan. I'm a retired conductor with Canadian Pacific Railway out yeah. in Vancouver. You may not recall, I, we actually met in the 80s. I had you as a pastor on VS Canadian out of Vancouver. Uh, and, yes, I and, do. You, you <laughs> do remember me. Oh, wow. Oh, absolutely. My God. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was the entertaining guy. But anyway, that's not why I uh, just wanted to say it was a great presentation. A, a friend of mine locally here, retired from CP, let me know about this meeting. I didn't know anything about it. Sadly, I was 20 min minutes late getting on. I just saw your last three or four shots of Via Skeena. So I, I can only imagine what I missed. But I just want to say your presentation was excellent. You speak very well. It was very, and you're very, oh my goodness, you're cer certainly knowledgeable of Alaska. Mm -hmm. Wow. I've done the last, I've done the way past Yukon twice, but I haven't done the Alaska Railroad. And I want to do it just one a minor thing you may not be aware of. I was actually in Whitehorse in 2015 and 20 and 2016 and rode that uh, 
uh, trolley, which came from Portugal, I think through a, a tourist operation in the States. After 2016, sometime between 2016 and before COVID, the, the White, uh, town of Whitehorse who subsidized it decided to shut it down. So unless they start running again, it's not operating anymore. You may not be aware of that. Um, that's that's the only thing. But uh, anyway, and I guess the Alaska Railroad, I wish I'd gone up there in the 70s and 80s when they ran the uh, the, the same equipment that VIA ran, but I, I missed it. But I gather they don't allow vestibule riding at all? Uh, I can't answer that. They certainly did allow vestibule riding in 2009. They had no problem with it whatsoever. And yeah. in fact, their gold leaf dome car has an enclosed pavilion outside on it, uh, which about eight or 10 people can go out on at one time. I don't know if they're still doing it. The trolley situation is interesting uh, because the White Pass New Yukon itself, as I mentioned, hasn't actually gone beyond the border to Carcross since the pandemic either. Uh, but they say they will be going back to Carcross next year. Uh, so hopefully hope they so. will. I will quietly run in the background for you again, the Skeena slide sequence. If okay. you can still see the screen. Uh, these are via promotional pictures. These are not ones I took. I did not hire a helicopter. Uh, VIA gave me these slides when I was promoting them for years. Uh, and ironically, VIA itself hardly ever used them. This one I took, but and oh. that one I took, but and these I took. Yeah. But those first couple were VIA promotional slides, and these are the ones you probably saw at the end. But, I saw at the end. How many, I gather you've ridden that train a few times. Oh yeah, yeah. I love yeah. the skina. You ever have my? You ever have for uh, my friend Tracy McLean or Diane Garth, the service managers on there? Probably Diane, because we had a lady service manager in 2017 when my wife and I rode the yeah. upgraded touring class. Yeah, they were and, great. They're old school and they gave nothing but first class service yeah, up there. They retired. It was now. really terrific. It, yeah. it featured the CN letting us have it in the way the CN loves to let VIA have it. Five minutes from the Prince George station, running only 45 <laughs> minutes late. They stabbed us for three and a half hours. Oh, it's terrible. Sending westbound freights around us before we were able to go into the station. We didn't get to our hotel till almost 1 a.m. Oh. Uh, and, you know, we were literally within a mile and a half at the station. It's enough to make you want to scream. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad I don't have to put up with that. Now I'm retired. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll digress here in a second. But, you know, the difference between now and the 80s is that when at least CP and CN, even though they were glad to be out of the passenger business, they did make a concerted effort in the 80s to keep the trains on time. Not like oh, yeah, they did now. absolutely. Because, you know, and kudos to the American railroads, BNSF, for keeping Amtrak on time much better than up here. It's a joke in Canada. Anyway, I will digress, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, and thank you, Carl. It was an excellent presentation. Thanks for the comment. Appreciate it very much. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, thanks, John. And, and please be aware that if you liked this program, it will be available on the DCNRHS YouTube channel. And here is a link to our DCNRHS YouTube channel. We've had almost two years of terrific programs. These are things that are just marvelous. And we've had just such a great group of speakers that have come in that it is really something to look at once again. And for those of you who are new to us, we encourage you to take advantage of looking at these videos and register, sign up. We'd love to have you again. And our last a uh, slide is uh, a thank you for participating. Here's an interior shot of our Dover Harbor and an exterior shot. So thanks a lot and thanks Carl and thanks for all of you attending today. And as a former charter of the Dover Harbor, I will tell you, I think the car is probably the most valuable single restored operable asset in the country because you put it back the way it was. And this shows people what rail travel was actually like. So many private cars are exquisite uh, palaces of luxury, but they have nothing to do with anything that ever actually operated on a railroad. This does. And uh, okay. I applaud the chapter for its decades of effort to make this car such an incredible piece of living history. Well, thank you very much, Carl. And, and you all will probably know from reading the timetable and reading, reading our president's emails to you all that the Dover Harbor has passed its 10 year Amtrak um, recently. So we hope to be on the rails for 10 more years. So thanks everybody. And thanks Carl for, for this great presentation. I appreciate this and I'd love to come again. As I said, I'm a, I'm a member since 1978 of the chapter and I've never actually been able to physically make a meeting. So it was a joy to finally do a program at least. Well, we'll look forward to another program with you, Carl. Thanks a lot. So we thank you very much. And once again, we welcome you all to our next presentation and we thank you so much for joining us here tonight.
Bye, all.